This is Candidate Conversations. I'm spokesman review reporter Amanda Selander. Uh, today, we're speaking for candidates for Washington House District Number 3. Uh, Democrat Natasha Hill is a spoken lawyer and activist who unsuccessfully ran for Congress in 2022. Uh, she was previously editor of The Black Lens. Uh, Republican Tony Keepy uh, is an insurance professional who unsuccessfully ran for Spokane City Council uh, previously. Uh, thank you both for speaking with me today. Appreciate you having us out. Thank you. Absolutely. So one issue that is at the top of voters' minds these days is housing and housing affordability. Uh, what would you do in the legislature to make housing more affordable? Uh, Natasha, let's start with you. Uh, I understand that you support rent stabilization and rent caps. Uh, how do you think that that can help those uh, struggling to afford housing? Um, well. It absolutely is going to help folks who are struggling to afford housing because the biggest issue we're having right now with housing is the cost of housing. Uh, we know wages haven't kept up, so people are having a difficult time affording that, especially our folks who are on fixed incomes. Um, there are rent stabilization ordinances at the state level, um, similar to what we've seen um, going through our city council here locally. Um, and those are things that I intend to champion. Um, we can have a really strong, robust business, um, small business for landlords, real estate market. I'm also a licensed real estate broker, so I do understand I'm part of our, our Realtors Association here. Um, so I do listen and show up and make sure I'm informed on these issues in terms of stakeholders on all sides. But the reality is, is we can't just allow for increases driven by a market when we know we don't have sufficient housing supply. And, and, and prices are based on, you know, supply and demand. And so there's things that we can do in order to keep people in their homes, which is going to make sure we have healthier and safer communities here in Spokane. Thank you, Natasha. Um, Tony, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you think uh, the state can do uh, in terms of housing affordability? Well, one thing we can look at the history of rent control. So mm -hmm. New York first implemented rent control. What happened? Over the time, you have higher rates, higher rents. More houses are now unavailable or empty because they can't afford because the renters, landlords are selling their pieces of property. Here in San Francisco in 1990, they implemented rent control. What happened? You had 15% of the houses are lost. So rent control will not work by history. You look at the only thing that's worked by when you control prices was back during World War II, when you controlled butter, uh, milk, everyday goods get, get controlled with price controls. But we want rent stabilization for the predatory uh, renters. So mm -hmm. we have renters that are owned by corporations. The small mom and pop, they own two to, th two to three homes. Those two to three homes, that's their livelihood. That's where they're making their money. If a house is appraised at $500,000, they're now paying taxes on $500,000. They're going to pass that increase in taxes to the person living there. So we can't just control rent control. What, what do you say to that, uh, Natasha, in terms of rent control? Is this a viable policy? Um, we're, we're talking rent stabilization, and I think in terms of educating ourselves on the difference between rent control and rent stabilization and comparing to ourselves to markets that we're simply not. We're not New York. We're not Seattle. And we have no intention of being any of those places. But we, we have to do is address the fact that we don't live in the 80s and 90s any longer. We live in the 2020s, and there's real housing issues. We've had unprecedented uh, uh, equity growth in our housing market. There isn't any two and three owner, uh, small and uh, mom and pop shop landlords who haven't benefited in hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity that they achieved in their property because of our rental market. Again, it comes back to supply and demand and keep people in their homes. Most people who are small and pop, mom pop, excuse me, small mom and pop shop landlords usually have their own home. And this is additional income that they make from owning other homes and renting those properties. That's a great benefit to our community. And a lot of those folks are not participating in, you know, raising prices to a point where folks can't afford it. However, we should not be as concerned about folks who own multiple properties when we're talking about people who are otherwise going to be unhoused. Those are the realities. And we can't just live in fantasy. We have to deal with the facts at hand. Tony, how, how would you respond to that and regarding... Um, you know, housing, the amount of housing that we have in the state and how to improve that, especially for uh, members of the community who are very low means and um, 
may be at risk of being unhoused or un unhoused themselves? Well, we are one million homes short in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. If we built, built 30,000 homes, that's $59 million in tax revenue that we would get. I support assistant rental programs where if somebody's having some bad times, maybe their, their child went to the hospital, went to the doctor's office, and they got a $2,000 medical bill. So what we want to do is make sure they have a short-term rental assistance program to stay in their home, make sure the landlord gets paid, and everybody's ha happy. Everybody wins. I I've had people call me, say they own property, and the property is valued at ha half a million dollars now but they're only charging $1,000 a month rent. Well, if we have, have rent stabilization, or I call it rent control, uh, the fair mar market value of that house is now $1,750. Fair market value, but they're only getting $1,000. So what do they do? Do they raise the price? Do they sell the property? If they sell the property, uh, they're only gonna get $350,000 for the house based on $1,000 a month when it's worth a half million dollars. And these are seniors that have invested all their livelihood into rental property. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on. Another uh, issue really important to voters is public safety. Uh, what can the state do to ensure the safety of its uh, residents? Uh, Natasha, would you like to go first? Um, you know, this is a great question in terms of what we need to do and we have to do and we have to look upstream in terms of what are the determinants of public health and safety and where our investments need to be at because we can't punish and police our way out of these problems and we can look at data and the history um, to know that and we've overtasked our first responders, our law enforcement with addressing issues in our community that need to be addressed elsewhere. And that comes back to housing, comes back to health care. Uh, that includes mental health, obviously. But when we look at who is actually becoming unhoused in our community, uh, we're looking at seniors and veterans and people on fixed incomes, our young folks, our foster youth, those disproportionate numbers of people who are being impacted. And so we've got to look upstream in terms of what's causing the public health and safety issues. And you will see that investments in child care, investments in housing, so that we have a strong labor force is what we need to focus on. And so some of that goes to investing in and supporting our union laborers, making sure they set that standard. Because if wages don't catch up, we aren't going to be having healthy communities. We're not going to have people in safe communities because if they can't afford housing and they don't have jobs that pay them enough to afford housing, food, and if they have families, child care, then ultimately we're not doing anything but, a, but spending a lot more money to have a revolving door uh, for these agencies. And that's not fair to any of us, especially us as taxpayers. Thanks, Natasha. Tony, uh, how do you think that the state should address public safety? One thing, we have to enforce our current laws. Here in Spokane, we had Proposition 1, where we voted to enforce the sit and law rules. 75% of the people voted for that one rule, but yet we don't enforce our laws. We still have the unhoused people sitting on the streets all day long, every day. Uh, we got to get them off the streets and give them the help they need. But we need to fund our policemen. That should be the number one priority of Washington, is funding our public safety and police. As I've been doorbelling, people tell me they don't feel safe to go downtown. Why? Why don't they feel safe to go downtown? You know the answer. Because of the drugs, the homeless. When Chad White closed his business down recently because it's been broken into 20 times, I mean, that's not right. We've got to enforce our current laws and make sure that people feel safe to go downtown or else we won't have a downtown. And look at the Spokane Business Association. They formed in the past two and a half months. Over 750 people showed up for the first meeting. The mayor was there and they... Uh, the mayor, city council, all the elected officials, and many candidates were there. And they talked about the homeless situation that we have, unhoused situation we have right here in Spokane, uh, that that is causing, driving people away from downtown Spokane. And we got to stop that. How would you respond to that, Natasha? Is, is uh, the unhoused people a big uh, determining factor when it comes to public safety? Um, you know, in terms, yes, and it's not safe for them either, right? It, it goes both ways. And when you cut health and human services like we have since the 90s, this is what you get. You know, I grew up in Hilliard. Um, I grew up in one of the highest poverty neighborhoods in Spokane. You know, me sitting here today um, is usual, is not statistically what you see when you look at candidates um, running for office. Um, and with my background, it took a lot of social programs, you know, growing up on welfare, um, qualifying for health benefits, um, which doesn't always come with great dental care, but there's things that we can do. These are social determinants of health and safety and how and the outcomes that we have. 
we've cut back so many investments in job training and education. The cost of education is astronomical compared to what it was in the 80s and 90s. And so now we have folks who are uh, coming out of four-year college, you know, even two-year college in debt. Um, Washington's doing a great job on that, but we can further our investments in two-year education and apprenticeships and trades to make sure people have good livable wage jobs um, that also allow for growth over time so they can get into home ownership. Um, you know, these are the things that really matter. So I don't think that me and my opponent disagree when it comes to investments in housing being one way that we can address that because when we have people who are unhoused, where do they go? Where do they go to shower? Where do they go to sleep? And we're asking people to not be human, essentially, in order to get services sometimes. People have families. They don't want to be separated from their significant other or their pets, things that actually give them some meaning in life to keep going. So we can't just ignore the fact that these are people in our community, that they need resources as well. Um, and the reality is, is the resources that we have that have been allocated, we've been putting to them toward things that haven't been effective. Um, so we can do some reallocation of that, obviously, and make sure we're investing in the services that are going to actually help these folks so they can maintain housing, maintain jobs. Um, and that's in, in terms of how we can address these issues going forward. I think that's where we need to see a shift. Again, we can't just punish and police our way um, out of these issues. Uh, these things are based in poverty. If we can solve the issue of poverty, it's going to change our society completely. You mentioned policing and uh, Tony mentioned uh uh, the need, in his view, to increase funding to police officers across the state. Do we you... have. That's all we've done consistently. We have not cut budgets. We have done nothing but continue to invest in things. The, the issue I see is overtasking, right? What are we asking them to do now with these budgets? I think that's what we have to do. We have to reassess. Uh, that goes for our fire department as well. We know that they're responding to um, all these fentanyl, cr the fentanyl crisis that we have. They are the main ones being tasked with this. Of course, they're going to need increased budgets for that. Um, so there, it's not that those arguments are valid. It's just how do we go upstream in order to solve these issues? Because um, that's what we need to look at. And we need to really look at how we can make sure that we address the crisis before it becomes a crisis. We didn't do that with the housing market. So now these people who are dealing with substance abuse issues or mental health issues that are unhoused, so we've got multiple layers here, and we have to address it from all sides. How, how would you respond uh, to that, Tony? Well, I, I think we need to look at the entire picture. What, what's causing the problem? What, why are we here? When you look at our, our unhoused people in, in Spokane, where are they from? I've talked to uh, people, that, psychiatrists, psychologists that work at Frontier Health, and they're telling me a majority of people coming in for mental health issues are not from Spokane. We need to make sure we're help, helping the people in Spokane. Or I don't think that's correct. And you should check your data on that, Tony. And I'm going to interrupt because You're a lot wrong. of the people You're who wrong. are unhoused You're wrong. are from You're wrong. here. You're wrong. You're wrong. I've talked to the people. Just you're, because of people you're, you're who are wrong. accessing you're health wrong. care doesn't you're mean wrong. that those are the only people who are suffering so, here. My um, time. You have people my generationally, time. unfortunately. I'll give you a moment to respond, but why don't you finish your thought, Tony? When we have people being bused here from, from Portland, we have people, unhoused people being bused here from Boise, Idaho. We have people being bused here from North Dakota and South Dakota. Go to the streets. Ask the people on the street, where are you from? They're, not, they're going to tell you they're not here from Spokane because we give wonderful services. We give all the services in the world, so they bus them here for these extra services. This is we got to stop. We, can't, we want to be passionate and have compassion, but we need to help our own, not all these people from other, these other cities. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Natasha, what was your, how would you respond to that? There's facts and data. Don't listen to politicians. Do your research because at the end of the day, you can put a spin on anything, right? And the reality is, is we have people here who've been here generationally and we could have done a whole lot more. I come from the communities that have been left behind. So when I hear people talk about communities they don't belong to and want to fix the problems for us, what I'm saying is we need to reestablish the investments that were working and move forward and stop the blame game. We can't blame people who are coming to our community because maybe there's stuff going on in their communities that's not serving them well either. I welcome those folks here and I hope we can take care of everybody that wants to live in Spokane. Thanks, Natasha. One other connected issue to um, policing or police reforms, and those have been considered at the state level uh, in recent years. Is there anything more that you think that needs to be done in terms of police reform, in terms of how uh, co police misconduct should be handled, how police should in interact with uh, residents? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, they're just not the only answer to public health and safety. Um, and we, we need to reevaluate in terms of prioritizing um, those investments. I think what we have seen is that when we invest in early childhood education, when we invest in job training, uh, we offset the need for those services. Um, when we deal with issues that we have a higher percentage of here in Eastern Washington, like child abuse and domestic violence, um, those things cannot be addressed with the agencies that we have that are responding. And I know officers, and they're very frustrated by not being able to do more when they're responding to those. But we have to have more health and human services, and that's where our investments really need to be. Um, at the end of the day, I think that there, again, is just a misperception in terms of what, what effect this is going to have, and we really need to start listening to the data. Uh, here in Spokane, we know that we have disproportionality in arrests and prosecutions, and they disproportionately impact black and native folks. And we even had a judge willing to write a, a, an opinion based on the uh, racism and disproportionality that we have that exists here. A lot of this stuff isn't based on any individual's personal bias. This isn't about whether some individual's racist. Usually those things can be uh, 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 accounted for and checked, and, but it's the what's built into the actual system. And the denial of this in a system that we know exists because history tells us this is documented stuff is frustrating as hell when we're in a region where there is a lot of division and we do have that far-right extremism. We don't need that hate in this region. We don't need that division in this region. We need to bring people together. I know we have more in common than we have different, um, but we have to be focused on those goals and stop pointing fingers and placing blame. Let's look at what works and move those things forward. Thanks, Natasha. Tony, uh, how would you respond? Do you think that there is a need for more uh, police reforms and uh, how uh, the state handles police misconduct? One thing we have want to see more the mentoring police. Here in Spokane, we are retiring senior police officers who know the job. They've been on the job for the longest. They're being asked to take early retirement, and many are re taking advantage of the retirement. So what do you have? You have young people that are just becoming a police officer, uh, they don't know the full ropes. Uh, we need to monitor it within the police societies, the Spokane Police Guild. They can monitor their own people. We don't need extra attention. It makes a lot of news, bad press. We need good press because people don't like what the police are doing because we get so much bad press. Let's give them good press of the good things they're doing in the community. Uh, thank you both. I'm going to move on to... A new question. Um, Tony, um, my understanding is that you are supporting some of the initiatives that we have on the ballot uh, in the fall. Um, and one of those is the repeal of the state's uh, climate commitment uh, law, which caps the amount of carbon that the state uh, has. Uh, why do you just support that initiative and what should the state do in regards uh, to climate change? That, that bill right now, the way it stands, is hurting the person on a fixed income. It's hurting the senior. It's hurting the, the minority person. When they have to pay an extra 42 cents a gallon for gas, they say it's as high as 50 cents a gallon for gas. When they buy a tank of gas, they're paying another $5 for a tank of gas. Where's that money going? Administration? Nothing is going to the Carbon uh, Safety Act, the, the Carbon uh, Climate uh, Act. Yeah. So we've got to take advantage of that. We need to do away with that. You want to vote yes, pay less, because it's hurting you in the long run. How would you respond to that, Natasha? Um, well, I'm encouraging folks to vote no on that, obviously. We mm -hmm. have goals, and we've made a commitment. And ultimately, the more rollbacks and setbacks we have, um, we need to be thinking about the folks who are going to be here 30, 40, 50, you know, generationally, um, and not just the folks that are here now. At the end of the day, I do believe we need an equity lens on any environmental policies that we have, including climate. Um, but we have a new season. We have a fire season, which is, you know, causing additional health concerns and issues that just increase the cost for everybody. Um, so there's some fallacies in terms of, like, what the cost is and where this goes. You can't see record profits for shareholders um, when it comes to oil companies or any of these other industries and then turn around and blame market demand. There's fallacies in that, and they need to go check, be checked, and there needs to be accountability. See where the money goes, um, and then we can make improvements. But we absolutely need to stay committed to the goals that we have and the commitments we've made when it comes to addressing climate change. Um, just following up on that, if it's repealed, do you think that the state can maintain those commitments and objectives that they had? Are those good commitments to have? If it's hurting the citizens, I do not support it. 
Uh, right now, a senior making $1,000 a month, they have $500 a month in, uti- in rental assistance, rental housing. Mm-hmm. They have $500 a month to spend. They got buying two th- takes of gas and they're paying an extra $10 a gallon. I'm for that person. I'm for that person that lives on that minimum wage that's $16 plus an hour. Uh, this hurts them. And when it's not go- doing anything towards the climate, look, I have solar panels on my house. I'm doing everything I can do. Do you have solar panels in your house? I have a hybrid car. My wife has a plug-in car. We're doing things we can do as an individual. Everybody, don't tell me how to live my life if you don't live it yourself. But what is in the the state, if this isn't the right policy, is there any policy that the state could do regarding the issue of climate change that you would support? What would that look well, like? All I see the state doing is charging more in taxes, more in taxes that hurt the everyday citizens in in Washington. That I will not support. We can do individual changes uh, to make our lives better that are cost effective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Natasha, um, going forward into um, addressing the environment and climate change beyond the commitments that we already have, what changes do you think that the state should make in order to go further and improve? Um, Well, we know we're seeing some of that already, just in terms of our commitment to investing in electric, right? Like, that is a big deal. I also have an electric car. Not everybody can afford it, and that's the reality. Like, communities I come from, they can't afford it. The $16.50 an hour minimum wage workers can't afford it. So to set the expectation for everybody really isn't fair. But we can roll back corporate tax breaks. We can stop subsidizing their record profits. We can make sure that everybody pays fair taxes and pays their fair share, and that would alleviate the burden on the folks that are the least resourced. They're not the ones that need to clean up the environment for the people who are making millions and billions of dollars here in our state. We're not talking nationwide. We're talking in Washington state. People are not paying their fair share at the top. They're price gouging. We've been seeing this going on for decades because we have rolled back way too many regulations. Um, And there isn't just this, you know, magical free market that operates without, without privilege without classism, without racism. Like these are realities that we live in. We don't live in a vacuum in a bubble that doesn't exist and isn't based on a history of treating women and children like property. Like let's be really honest about where we're at and where the money goes. And the people at the top who are the most resource and have the most money and the, and the oil companies who are charging all those folks um, these high gas prices, That can all be changed, but we've got to do that together as a society. Our government and our elected officials have to decide who they're actually representing, their corporate donors or the people, the people who are carrying the burden. Our most valuable resources are people and our labor, and we have not taken care of that. And and we have squeezed the middle in order to have exorbitant uh, CEO salaries, right? Why people are getting subsidized living on welfare. So at the end of the day, if we can fix those issues, then we can address some of these uh, climate issues so that the burden isn't borne by the people who are least resourced. And corporations coming to the state of Washington understand we're a community and we expect you to show up and pay your fair share and invest here. And if you're not willing to do that, then maybe this isn't the state for you. Because I know other states that charge a whole bunch more in taxes and they don't have any problem being competitive. So don't believe the fallacy. That's That's not reality. We can have all of these things. They're not mutually exclusive. And I think it's unfair to tell people with the least amount of resources who are strapped to put that gas in their car that the problem is something that's they're doing, right? It's coming from corporations. It's not coming from just your everyday taxes. Thank you so much, Natasha. I really appreciate it. Tony, um, wanted to give you a chance to respond to that and ask, um, you know, a lot of what she was saying in terms of corporate profits, uh, high income individuals, and really focusing if there is taxation on these issues and it's seen others, uh, that uh, taxation sh- should come from those folks. Do you think that that's something that the state should look, la- look at or not? One thing, a corporation does not pay tax. You can charge them 100% tax. What do they, they do? They're going to pass that right on to the consumer. The consumer pays that tax. And finally, I heard they said the president-to-be, or maybe, with China, has taxes going to tax, tax China. With, and they're actually saying, well, pe- everyday people are going to pay that tax. That's right. Corporations don't pay taxes. The people that pay the tax, they pay, pay that through, pass it through. You and me, when we buy that good, that widget, that service, 
we're paying that that tax. Corporations will not pay a tax. Thank you, Tony. Um, one issue when it comes to taxation that I wanted to ask you about are uh, limits on how much local jurisdictions can raise property taxes each year without voter approval it came up in uh, the last session. Uh, at present, that cap is set at 1%, but many cities and counties across the state have asked the bar to be raised to 3%. Uh, Tony, would you be supportive of that effort to increase that limit? Why or why not? I would not be. And I, I tell you, my taxes on my house, I'm paying an extra $134 a month of taxes on my house because the tax assessors raised the value of my house the past five years. That's five years. And I'm paying $134 a month. That's We could not afford my house we live in now if we we're trying to buy it now with the high interest rate. So I, I would not support that. I would not do that. Uh, 1% tax increase is more than plenty. I would like to know how is the government spending my extra extra money? Where's my $134 a month going to? What services are they providing with that extra money? The city is behind $50 million. Why? You're, you're charging me more in property taxes. Natasha, um, could you give a response to that? And would you support uh, increasing uh, that cap if it were to come up again? I think the issue we're really looking at here is how our state and local governments work together in terms mm -hmm. of making these decisions. Because there is a lot of tension, mm -hmm. right? There's different locales in terms of what their needs are and how their needs are being met, where they're at in terms of being behind um, on their taxing. Um, taxes are the way we raise revenue. They're not a bad thing. We all get benefits from taxes. Um, it's really about the disproportionality and how much you're paying in taxes, and that does impact you, whether you're a property owner uh, or not. And so I think those are important things to look at, and I do think that we need to be working together at both the state and local level. Um, setting an arbitrary number based on what you pay and how it impacts you is a lot of an I, I, I conversation, and I'm here to represent for more than just the people who vote for me, but constituents across the third legislative district and looking at what their needs are. Um, so to, for me to arbitrarily pick a number that it should be set, whether that's by state or local government, I'm candidly not there yet. And I'm willing to listen to folks on any side of this um, to see what their positions are and a number that makes sense. There's experts out there. I'm not, a, as a representative, we do not have to know it all. And I appreciate my future seatmate, Tim Ormsby, for pointing this out. We're not tasked with knowing it all, but we are tasked with going to the people who know about these issues and listening. That is our role as a representative. It is not just to tell them what we think we know based on our own personal experience. That's not fair to everybody else who doesn't share those experiences or have those resources. Thank you so much. Um, I want to move on to the issue of health care, um, which is another issue that uh, residents and readers of the Spokesman Review are very concerned about. Um, how best can the state make health care affordable and accessible to people in the state? Stay out of it. Uh, I sell Medicare. Now, this year we have the Inflation Reduction Act. Because of the, what they've implemented, $2,000 is the most a senior can pay, which is great. I mean, but they're losing $6,000 in prescriptions. They used to charge $8,000 for the prescription. Now all the carriers have to make up that $6,000. You're going to be losing some dental, you're going to be losing some vision. You're losing your OTC card that people depend on. But that's what's happening this year because of the government interfering with a system that's worked great. Uh, it, it, it's totally wrong. And we've got two carriers leaving the state of Washington. You will know October 1st when everybody receives their, their ANOX annual notice of change. And you've got four prescription drug plans leaving the state of Washington. So they're leaving Washington because they can't make a profit. And some of these are nonprofit organizations. So they, they can't make a profit. Oh, my, my phone on my, my watch is ringing. That's so fine, Tony. I had to turn it Go off. <laughs> so uh, they can't make a profit. They, they're leaving the state. We need more carriers here where they can make money and offer great benefits for the, every individual person. You know, my health care plan, my daughter-in-law's health care plan, I helped her pick a plan out. To me, that's not even insurance because they have a $10,000 max amount of pocket they have to spend. That's not insurance. This is all because government interference. Thanks, Tony. Um, what would you say to that, that health care, Tony's saying health care, that should be something that the state butts out of. How would you respond to that? 
I guess Tony doesn't care about the people who can't afford it. I mean, at the end of the day, the only way that I afforded health care growing up was being on welfare and qualifying. So I guess poor people aren't part of the equation in Tony's world. But in my world, they absolutely are. And I think health care is a human right. We pay in as taxpayers, right? What, what's more important than our health care and our housing? Those are the most important things, because if we're not here and we're not housed and we're not healthy, I don't think we're showing up for work and taking care of our kids very well. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, I do think that we have to be smart in terms of our market. The more people that are paying in, the lower the costs are going to be. We have to work with our community partners. Um, one of ours is Providence, who's the second biggest employer here in Spokane. And they've recently seen strikes. Um, because they need to listen uh, to their community that they're here to serve. There also needs to be an understanding about the difference between a nonprofit and a not for profit. Those are not the same thing and they have different goals and different values. And how that works is we get to say as taxpayers, as a community, through our elected officials, as we're negotiating and bargaining with these entities, giving them the incentives that they have to be here to work and serve our community. Private health care, privatization of health care is not always the answer. Yes, we need more than one option. There shouldn't just be one, more, one option. But the more people paying into the system is what's going to lower that. We're not the only country in the world, and we have lots of other examples that we can learn from in order to have a better system. Folks who just want things to be the way they want things to be without looking at data and listening to experts and seeing who's going to be able to access those resources simply need to not be involved in, in, in elected positions and public positions. Uh, be an active voter. Uh, be a part of your community. Let your voice be heard. But maybe you shouldn't be making decisions for everybody if you only want things that are going to serve you. Thanks, Natasha. One thing I wanted to follow up with you, Tony, is I think you said in your answer there, and perhaps I misunderstood what you were saying, but uh, that the system without government interference works great. I'm wondering if you could expand on that, especially with your experience, you know, working in health insurance. Um, what what is the ideal system, even if it is in a in a uh, private sense? Well, what I'd like to see is why would a 25 year old, if you if you work for a business and that business offers insurance, and you pay an average cost, and maybe your average age is 50 years old. So you're paying $500 a month. That's not affordable for a 25 year old. Why can't we do a pick and choose your plan? A 25 year old do, does not need all these extra benefits that a 50 year old would need or a 60 year old would need. I, I just think if they, they picked what will work best for them and as a 25 year old, that's gonna be more efficient. It's gonna be less expensive for that person. But the Affordable Care Act came out. Everybody is supposed to have insurance. If you make less than $1,500 a month, you qualify. So you, you'll get medical medical insurance. You go to the emergency room. If you don't have insurance, they're going to take care of you. So I, I don't buy this saying that I'm not for the poor people because they can't afford insurance. When the Affordable Care Act gives them insurance, you apply for it. And I help people all the time apply for Medicaid, what they need to do because they, they hit the limits, meet, meet the limits. So I do that for them. Thanks, Tony. Another health care issue, and this is related to another initiative on the ballot here, is uh, – the uh, state's WACARES system, which uh, provides long-term care insurance to residents. The initiative on the ballot would uh, make paying in and uh, the currently mandatory paying into this program, make it so people can opt out. Now, people, those who are supportive of the WACARES system say that this opt-out would perhaps uh, bankrupt the system. Um, what would you say about this issue of walk hairs and long-term care insurance? It's only $36,000. It's capped at $36,000. Mm -hmm. That will not work very long in a facility. And you've got to lose all your assets before you qualify for that. Why do I want a 16-year-old, 17-year-old paying 58 cents, 53 cents per $100 out of their pocket for all their life? As they make more money, they put more, more money into it. They'll never see that. I mean, $36,000 is not enough. We need to look at the whole thing. Right now, that, that's an extra $3, $4 a month every two-week period check. For most people that I work, I, I, sell, I deliver pizzas for Domino's, so I, I also make a minimum wage job. I, I know what it's like uh, for them. And taking $3, $4 out of the paycheck every two weeks, that's a lot of money for some people. Thanks, Tony. Natasha, um, what do you think about this issue of WA cares and long-term care? Um, again, I think if we give people this option to pull out, then the costs go up and then nobody can afford it. And then you're kind of left to your own demise in a market that's not friendly, especially to people who are in poverty. 
the other thing is when you, you know, our, you know, poverty rates are set to where you have to be so, so, so poor. And then once you bump out, you lose all these benefits. So it's really the folks who are in the middle that are getting squeezed the most that end up being strapped with these costs. Um, the pay in at the end of the day, I think it comes out to like if you work about 50 years, you're paying in about two, two, 200, 240 a year, 20 bucks a month, I think is about what it comes out to. You're talking $10,000 over 50 years for $36,000. So in terms of people paying in versus with them getting it out, in terms of whether, the, whether that's going to be there or not, I mean, right now, can we really trust our systems? Uh, we're looking at, you know, our Republicans wanting to, you know, roll back Social Security as if that's... That's not true. That's not true. That may not be your position, That's not Tony. true. Don't, that's, you're being so you're, rude. You're saying dude. something that's not true. Okay, well... Republicans uh, are looking to take away Social Security politely. Medicare. Thanks. No, this I appreciate show, Tony. Okay? Let's uh, <laughs> let uh, her finish the point and then I'll let you respond. That is a Republican platform talking point at the national level for sure. So if you're taking that personally and you have a problem with that, you should talk to your party members. But to attack me for repeating Republican talking points isn't necessary. Because at the end of the day, what we're really trying to accomplish is making sure everybody has access and it's affordable. And if we don't do that, then we're leaving the people who are least resourced. I know what it's like to start from the bottom and not have help. You're making a lot of assumptions about what it's going to take for somebody to be self-sufficient, especially in this economy. Thank you, Natasha. Would you like to respond, Tony? Yeah, Social Security is not an entitlement. It's a benefit that we paid into all our lives. Every paycheck we put Social Security in, it's matched. And the Republicans... If there may be somebody in there that wants to do away with it, but the Republicans as a whole, you bring it to a vote, will not support that because we depend on our Social Security. But we've got to look at it. What's, where is it going in the long term? Where's the money going to be? I mean, we have borrowed from Social Security millions and millions of dollars and never paid it back. We let our congressmen do that. They borrowed from Social Security and have not put it back into the system. We need Social Security. We depend on Social Security. And we're not going to do away as a Republican. I won't support that. Thank you, Tony. Um, one issue that uh, I wanted to bring up uh, was uh, reproductive health. And uh, it's something that's very protected in Washington state. I wanted to ask you, Natasha, uh, is there any changes you would like to see at the state level uh, regarding reproductive health care, especially as it's become a more prevalent issue across the nation as a whole? Absolutely. I mean, I intend to be a champion for that. Um, you know, we haven't had a woman in the delegation since Lisa Brown was serving um, here in the third. So I feel like that's an important thing. Because we are a uh, border city with Idaho, we've become a safe harbor for folks who aren't getting reproductive care. And this goes beyond just the right to have an abortion. Um, if you don't, if you're putting um, our uh, providers at risk of liability um, and lawsuits, they're not going to practice there. You know, they have to con be concerned about their own family, right, and their own businesses. So the reality is, is we've lost a lot of OBGYNs over in Idaho. We're absorbing a lot of those costs. It's taxing on now on our systems, our hospitals. And as the second biggest city in the state, we know how loud the voices are on, on the west side of the state. And we need somebody here. And I intend to be that champion and to be a loud voice when it comes to reproductive rights and care and just the investments we need. And that goes back to our labor force. It goes back to health care and strengthening that relationship that we do have um, with our medical um, uh, providers here in eastern Washington. Thank you, Natasha. Tony, um, what do you think of the policies that Washington State has regarding uh, reproductive health care and abortion? Do you think that there should be any changes to that? Well, in 1970, there was an initiative, and the people overwhelmingly voted to have productive health rights. And mm -hmm. I would support the people, just like the $35 uh, tag that was passed a couple years ago got overthrown by Bob Ferguson. Well, that's not what the people wanted. This is Productive rights is what people want here in Spoke, Washington. I would support that. I would not try to change anything that they voted for, like the $35 tags. Thank you, Tony. Um, one uh, issue I wanted to bring up while we're speaking, uh, Natasha, there was some tension in the primary between you and Ben Stuckert, uh, the other Democratic candidate there, and it came a very, very close race. 
uh, in between who would get to the runoff. Um, I believe that there was an investigation by the Democratic Party into a verbal altercation that you had with him at this year's Pride Parade. Um, That's inaccurate. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was no verbal. Well, I just want to correct that. There was sure. no verbal altercation between me and Ben Stuckert at all. Okay. He wasn't even there after the parade. I had no interaction with him. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I just wanted you. to correct that part. No, no, but I've, I can respond. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, I understand. I don't believe that he's endorsed you in this. Do you think that that tension in the Democratic Party at all uh, will impact the general election here? Um, you know, I I think the reality is, is like there is diversity on all sides, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure just like on the Democratic side, on the Republican side, you have, uh, you know, a breadth. We shouldn't all be alike. And for me, during that um, occasion, I wanted to make sure it was really clear where I stood on rent stabilization, which was different than my opponent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I drew those distinctions very clearly, and it ruffled some feathers. I'm new, and I'm not like other candidates, and that's part of why I'm running. Um, we've seen a lot of communities be left behind, and I come from a lot of those communities, and some of them are overlapping. Um, but a lot of this is class politics in terms of what I see. And sometimes it's about who you are and not what you do. And I think that that was just a moment where they weren't sure if that was appropriate for Democrats to be distinguishing um, themselves in that way. Um, there wasn't anything inappropriate. I'm not aware of any investigation or any results of any investigation. Um, but what I do know is that I'm really proud to speak up for issues that are important. And when I was at Pride that day, one of the main things that came up was housing and cost of living, meeting a youth who ended up working on my campaign who was unhoused who was carrying a backpack around, his friend offered to carry for him because it was so damn heavy. Because if you leave it in the locker at the homeless shelters, they get robbed. This is every belonging you have. You're a student. You are working. You're just trying to survive. I didn't ask questions on why you're not living at home, what's up with your parents. I'm at pride. I'm gonna make a lot of assumptions about what that youth may be going through without asking invasive questions. But the reality is, is housing and healthcare and jobs are so important. And those folks, our LGBTQ AI2 plus community is disproportionately impacted by these issues as well. And so I was speaking from a strong place of passion, which I often do. Um, and again, I wanna be a strong voice and I wanna make things look a little different and shake things up because I wanna get more folks engaged. People from communities that I belong to, they want somebody to stand up and just say it how it is. And if I do that, I hope that they'll join me and that there's more of us doing that. Thank you, Natasha. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you, Tony, as we're sort of wrapping up here is, you know, this seat has been a Democratic stronghold for many, many years. Uh, you know, what is your plan? Do you think you have a shot this year? Um, you know, what are you hoping to accomplish in this campaign? Well, Dave Lucas got 42 percent vote. Uh, Natalie got 44 percent of the vote. I need six percent more to win. And right mm -hmm. now... I am a reasonable person. I'm talking to Democrats. I've been doorbelling. I've, we've hit 6,000 homes, uh, 1,200 myself. My team's done 6,000 homes, and we're listening. They're concerned about the issues. They're concerned about inflation, going to the grocery store. Uh, they're going to vote this year with their pocketbook. They're going to say, hey, this seat has been Democrat controlled for 40 years. It's time for a change. Tony's going to work on both sides. He is a good, reasonable, he's a good listener. And it, it's funny, this, this week we're just having a conversation. Somebody said, I'm a strong Democrat. I've never voted Republican first, but you are sensible. I'm going to vote for you. And I'm hearing that over and over and over. I've got that 6%. I believe I'll, I'll win this seat because I understand the issues and the concerns of the people. I mean, they want public safety is a big issue. They want affordable housing. They want a good paying job, not just a minimum wage job. They want to be able to save money and put money aside to save it for their ch children to go to college. And they want to retire with dignity. This is what the people want. These are the issues they're talking to me about. So I will win this race, and I'll win it because this is your seat. It's not my seat. I'll listen to you and work for you. And I may have to vote for some things I don't like, but if, if 100 people tell me to vote for this and two people say don't vote for this, I'm going to support the people every time. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and Natasha, I wanted to give you an opportunity before we go. Why should voters in the 3rd District uh, su support you in your campaign? Um, you know, I'm really proud just to be in this position. As you mentioned, we had a tough primary. 
Um, proud of Spokane for just showing up um, and making sure their voices are heard. A lot of my run comes around wanting to really engage folks in the community to show up. Um, I'm a single parent raising two kids, doing the work, running a small business. And so I just think it's important that we have representation with lived experience. And that's what you're going to get with me. I will absolutely be a champion when it comes to housing, when it comes to labor, when it comes to pro-choice. I absolutely believe in the right to privacy and bodily autonomy, that people should be able to do whatever the hell they want with their own bodies, as long as they're not harming somebody else or themselves. Um, and we can make some different um, rules that apply to everyone as far as um, in inclusion. Um, this is a place that's grown a lot. You know, I grew up in Spokane and it definitely looks a lot different. We need to include more people in the decision making process. Um, people from those communities I keep mentioning that have been left behind. It's not just a west side, east side type of thing, but I want to bring people from the east side, from communities here in the city of Spokane and the county of Spokane who don't often get an opportunity to be heard so that their representatives and their elected officials can hear their stories too and it not just be the folks who are in close proximity um, to people in leadership and power. Um, so I encourage folks to really look um, at the issues, the things that they care about, to show up this election and vote. Um, vote with your pocketbook. I think that's actually a smart move. Vote with your heart. Vote with your values. At the end of the day, just vote. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thank you both for taking the time today to speak with me. I really, really appreciate it. Appreciate being here. Thank you. Uh, this is Candidate Conversations uh, from the Spokesman Review. Uh, and this has been a debate between Natasha Hill and uh, Tony Keeping.